I would love to say, or maybe not, but this New Year's and New Year's Eve, I didn't go out and celebrate. I didn't sit up all night waiting to watch fireworks. Matter of fact, I did what I do just about every night. I worked on the ministry, thought about things that were going on in the past, the present, the future. I even worked on looking at some of my old blogs and some of the old ministry items that I was doing last year and the year before. And then as I had prayed during the day and the day before, God had set my feet towards preparing, rearranging the house for my wife because she's coming back today or tonight sometime, <laughs> probably late from visiting her family in Utah. But I thought about New Year's and all the different New Year's that I've been through and each one I always seem to be kind of not really in the festive mood. You know, I don't, I don't see looking back, you know, the old Lang Syne feeling or the looking forward, the great anticipation of some new old boy excitement. Rather, I kind of, I kind of get sober minded about New Year's, partly because it's, oh, that time of year that I tend to get reflective and thoughtful that I kind of consider my ways and the ways I failed, the things that I've done, the things that I wish I had done, things that I have yet to do. And I consider also the accomplishments and the good things that have happened. But when I do that, I, I also look at the people around me and I, I worry, I get concerned, I feel compassion for the ages because we live in the last days. My New Year's is always full of looking and anticipating how short a time we have left. And when I thought about 2012 and this New Year's coming up, I was very mindful of how many people are going to be deceived this year. You know, there there is no doubt. I mean, it's pretty obvious that a lot of people are very wound up. They're very angry. They're very mad. They're very violent. They're very anticipating some kind of devastation and wanting to create that devastation. It's like there's a spirit in the world, a power that's gone out, a great force, as it were, that's happening in the world from 2011 that's going into 2012. I mean, we took 10 years of war and we put that upon an entire generation, an era of warfare. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a Christian thing to do. I know we hear about and we talk about and we honor those who have died for the cause of patriotism and serving our country and praise the Lord. I honor those who serve what they choose to serve. Now, I can't tell you that I feel comfortable with everything that we do when we say that we're patriotic because in some ways I say, well, why would I want to do some of the things that we do when I could choose to serve the Lord and fear Him and accomplish something that's eternal as opposed to something that's temporary. I mean, just looking at the Afghanistan wars or the Iraq wars or now the Irans or all the different generational wars that have gone on even in my lifetime where regimes have changed over and over again and gone back to the same thing that they were before. I see the power of God in that because it's not about us making change in governments. I see maybe, hey, God has said, look, I have placed my hand upon this nation or I have cursed this land or I have chosen this particular area and it will be what I declare it to be. 
Because you see, God has said in the scriptures that there are places, you know, like even in Gaza, the places where it would be like a desert place, or it'd be a turmoil place, or it'd be always in upheaval. There are places like in in the Middle East that God has cursed from everlasting to everlasting. He has said it, and if you could trace it, you could see today that those particular areas are still under a curse. God says something, he means it. I tend to look at some of the nations that way and see, well, if God said he was going to do this with them, I think it's going to keep happening. So my look at 2012 is kind of like, you know, it's kind of sad that we took 10 years out of some people's lives and asked them to go to war, to endure war, to come back suffering from the effects of war, and then to be ready to go to another war, especially in the Valley of Megiddo. We're looking at a generation that's prepared for, for Armageddon, really, because they are, in their conscience, in their soul, more prepared now than they ever were before of any generation that existed before us to go to the very last battle and die. Now, praise the Lord, if you're a Christian and you served your country, you know, by asking God to go and do what you felt led to do, then God will heal you from the effect of shedding men's blood. And God help us for that cause and effect that we've created in the world where we think we have to be the person to change the king's hearts to rearrange the nations, to police the world for democracy's sake. You see, we're not saying it's because we want to bring Christianity in. We're saying because we want to bring this supposed freedom that really, just like some of the Middle Eastern countries protest about, does enslave yourself to technology and technocracy. You become enslaved to a free market system that you really are working to earn a living and it's not about socialism and it's not about <laughs> democracy or free enterprise it's about caring and having the ethos or the ethics behind the actions that you do so I see this power that's gone out into the world when I look at 2012 and I say oh my god do you realize people who have served in the military are coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder do you realize that these people are not trained up into particular vocations that work in society in a peaceful environment, but they are trained for war? Their hands have been prepared for war? Oh, the promise is they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But what have we done these last ten years in preparing for the return of Jesus Christ? What have we done to give our lives and serve the Lord? Or have we given our lives to serve the country? 2012 makes me nervous. Because then, besides this violent force, this demonic activity that has created a violent nation, a violent people, that now we can just use our drones to fly into someone else's country and kill even innocents with what we call the guilty. We can do it without the consequence of feeling the blood on our hands and looking eye to eye at a person's soul as we take their life and eternally damn them to hell. That worries me in this new year. That concerns me in a great way because God is sovereign and we have chosen to abstain from his sovereignty and do what we want in our authority and we do that in killing others in different countries that we say we're protecting ourselves before it happens because we can't trust the Lord to protect us we can't trust in riches we can't trust in democracy we can't trust in these other things we have to trust in the strength of our arms the power of the fist, 
the might that we have, we can't trust God to deliver us. So the nation of America doesn't look at who is sovereign. It pretends it has its own authority. When Israel did the same, God separated the northern tribes from the southern tribes. And then eventually the northern tribes were taken over by a greater superpower. And then slowly the southern tribes likewise. When you go with violent means to solve violent situations and circumstances, violence begets violence. And the violent will always fight the violent. You can't fight violence with violence. Jesus said that we would overcome by love. And people say, Wait, how, how do you overcome a terrorist with love? How do you not overcome a terrorist with love? As you see people that have become Christian, likewise came, not because they said, Oh, well, you know what? My violent means wasn't working, so I decided to try God. No. They discovered the love that Christians had for one another, and they wanted that. And they chose to follow Jesus, and then discovered that God was real, and then was shocked. So, there's a power that existed and grew in great strength from 10 years ago, slowly getting bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger, that is violent in nature. And if you look back to the days of Noah, if you look back to Genesis, you're going to find that the reason why God condemned the world and man itself wasn't just because supposed homosexuality and sexuality, but because every thought of man was towards violence. And they were violent in nature, and they had corrupted their way. We have, and we were told more than 10 years ago, that as we raised up violent children, they would become violent in their old age. And now that the children have grown up in a violent atmosphere, their children now, likewise, have no problem shooting their parents, planning the murder of a boyfriend and girlfriend, planning the murder of a mother or a father of either one's parents. That's the power of violence that has come forth in this generation, this last generation we live in. We are not looking forward to, in a lot of ways, 2012 as being a great celebration of the accomplishments of American idealism, but rather a universal gradual acceptance of violence as a means to an end. We have the Arab Springs. We have the violent, violent revolt in Israel at this time, right now, today. Orthodox Jews claiming to serve God are beating and stoning little girls and children on their way to school because they don't want women to get out of their place and become suddenly revolting against a man's authority. They need to be put in their place. They need to be kept suppressed. They need to be put back into their role as women who produce children, especially boys to study Torah. Ultra-Orthodoxy in Israel? Fighting? Shooting? Stoning? not shooting, but stoning, and killing little children. And then in Israel, likewise, when we look at Israel, as a sign of the times, especially living in these last days, we have, where else, settlers who are taking up arms to fight the government of Israel, to tell them, no, we're not part of you. We will start our own cities. We will have our own government. We will run our own settlements and violently revolting against the army of Israel. Violence begets violence, and that power, that force of violence has gone out into the world. 
in these last few years. In 2012, we see the same coming forward. God help us. So as Israel divides, then we see also, we talk of at one time Israel would just go and solve a problem. They would attack some country. We have to defend ourselves, so they attack. And it's over with. Now it's threats, constantly threats, constantly threatening to attack Iran, constantly saying, we're going to do it, 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 we're going to do it. And then it's filter, infiltrating and using internet and technology to attack, to stop something from happening before it happens. Just like we said we have to do with our drones. Now we have, oh, guess what? We have drones in Israel. We can fly over the Palestinians. We can fly over the Arab communities. We can fly over the Israeli Arab communities. And we can determine that, ah, it looks like a, a meeting, a gathering, and destroy a household that some innocents do die. And at the same time, Israel's rebuilding and growing and becoming more godly? Or has Israel today become completely ungodly? The question is, when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you were never told to support Israel no matter what. You were told that they would sell themselves and sell their soul, literally, to Satan himself in the form of the Antichrist. So what do we see? We see this hyper-patriotism that says, Oh, I'm a Zion. I'm a Christian Zionist. I will stand with Israel no matter what, even if they kill, even if they destroy themselves, even if they sign up with the Antichrist. I will stand with them no matter what. Is that really what you want to do, Christian Zionist? Do you really want to be violent in your support of Israel? Do you really not want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? The Christian Zionist has absolutely no scriptural background to stand up and say, Oh, we support you right or wrong. We support you no matter what. No, that's not what it says. It says, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And that's all it says. It does not say take a stand with Israel, because God will judge Israel. And if you're standing in God's judgment when God judges Israel for its sins, you will be judged. Do you dare sign up to follow Israel no matter what, right or wrong, and stand under that judgment that God will put upon his own people when they are wrong? Do you choose to suffer that too? Well, you know, we just mean we support them. No, you do what the scripture says. If you don't know what God says, you have to go to what the scripture says, always in the word of God. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Bless the people of Israel. Don't curse them. In some circumstances, Pray about what you're choosing to support or not support. When the nation of Israel does something that's wrong, then you don't support it. When they do something that's right, then you support it. Like any other human being. You don't support sin, Christian Zionists. Then we have the political Christian. Besides being a political Christian Zionist supporting Israel, now we have the political violence of people wanting to, oh, we got to throw out the president. We got to get rid of him. We got to make up these mockeries of him. We have to challenge authority that God has placed over us because we don't want that yoke or that standard that God has put upon us. No, we want our own choice. We want to do our own thing. We want to throw out the president of the United States of America that was dutifully, legally, God appointed and elected. But we're a violent people now. We have our own American spring. If we don't get rid of it, we're going to revolt. What kind of Christian have we become as we look into the future from the past? Have we become that violence in this new 2012? Are we really angry and mad inside? Are we really distraught? Are we really mad as hell that we're going to get even? Gun sales have skyrocketed through the roof. 
because the people of God have forgotten their Lord. They no longer have faith that God can provide. So they have to take matters into their own hands. They have to do as they choose to do. They have to stand up for the right, not just to bear arms, but to use them. Violence has invaded America, and the violent, God has said, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And unfortunately, Satan himself, by letting this power go forward from a very small start, a very small principality of violent people, to spread like cancer throughout the Christian church, Christianity, political means, socialism, democracy. How many violent actions have been taken by occupied people that were supposed to be just socialism? Now we have anarchism as being an answer so that we can just, in every protest now, there's always going to be the anarchists inside choosing to do violent things. When will the church begin to have, in the middle of a sermon, in the middle of a Bible study, in the middle of a declaration of the Holy Spirit being spoken, somebody just stand up and shoot a pastor in the pulpit? When will a man of God die standing before his people? How soon before the Christian thinks they're doing right, like the Jew thought they were doing right, when in the Maccabean revolt, Jew killed Jew in order for spiritual purity, and then later in Christianity we had the Inquisition. 2012 to me does not look like a great possibility of wonderful things happening for the peace, the love, and the joy, but rather a very sober-minded time to so look very carefully at the people you associate with and to see if we've discipled them in Jesus or if we decided to depart from them and leave them to their own understanding of the Word of God. My New Year's message isn't one that I could have celebrated on New Year's Eve and it isn't one that I would celebrate now. It is one of looking forward to prayer as I consider other people that lived in the same violent world that I live in as I consider men of God that did the same feelings I had as they looked out on the world and they said God no they're getting it wrong they're heading the wrong direction why won't they come back to what is right they're not listening to your voice. They're not reading your word. They don't understand. God, help us. I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even departing from your precepts and your judgments. O oh my God, I have sinned. I have committed iniquity. I have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Would you pray with me for the new year? Would you think about what you see really around you in regards to prophecy and the end of times and the end of this age? Because we won't last too much longer. We won't terminate in 2012 like some think of the Mayan prophecy but we are already reaping a harvest of violence would you look at Daniel 9 verse 5 and pray with me 
with your name there or your own self saying I have sinned I have committed iniquity I have done wickedly I have rebelled can you confess your sin can you admit in your own life where you have done that do you hate Obama do you hate your neighbor do you hate the Muslims do you hate the child molester do you hate those around you are there areas of your life you need to profess and confess for the new year to start please do think about it please do pray neither have we heeded your servants the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and to our princes to our fathers and all the people of the land God forgive me for not listening to your pastors to your teachers to your elders to your deacons God forgive me for they have spoken to our presidents to our senators to our administrators to our policemen to our fathers to our mothers to our children to all of us who live in this land God we haven't listened we haven't paid attention and now God hear our prayer oh Lord righteousness belongs to you but to us we are ashamed as it is this day Oh God, we of America, as the men of Judah in that time, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and in New York and in San Francisco and in Los Angeles and in Chicago and in Las Vegas and in Anchorage and in all the land that America stands, God, those near and those far off in all countries which you have put all Americans and many have left God for your people too where you have driven the Jew to be far removed from the place where you would have them to be because of the unfaithfulness which each person has committed against you God I pray help us and hear us they have sinned I have sinned God hear our prayer we are ashamed as a people we are ashamed as a nation I am ashamed as a born-again Christian on this day when a nation celebrates I am ashamed O oh Lord God Almighty, to us belongs shame of face. To us belongs shame for our kings, for our presidents, for our senators, for our government, for our judiciary, for our policemen, for our firefighters, for our soldiers, for our nation, for our people, for our fathers, for our mothers, for our children, for our ministers, for our church. We are ashamed we are ashamed because we've sinned against you Father we nation I live in have sinned against you hear my cry O oh Lord attend unto my prayer from the ends of the earth will I cry out to thee and when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I that is higher than I for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy 
and now my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That is higher than I. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. We have not walked in His laws. We have not done which, that which He has set before us, which our pastors have told us, which our teachers and elders have given us, which our men of God have reminded us. Yes, Father, all America has transgressed Your law and has departed so as not to obey Your voice. Yes, Father, the church has transgressed against Your word and has departed so as not to obey Your voice and cannot even hear You speak. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of your God, the curse and the law that you have declared throughout the book of Revelation, the curses that you have said would come upon us, that we would sow and we would reap, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. God, you have confirmed your word which you spoke against us and against our judges who we have put into judging our land and they have rebelled against you. And it has brought upon us a great disaster for under the whole of heaven neither has anything been done such as this has been done to us. And even in that day with Daniel to Jerusalem, God, look at the land that you caused your grace to be shed upon. And never before has a people so neglected you. As it is written, Father, in your word, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God. We have not cried out to you. We have not asked that you would redeem us. We have not begged that you would have mercy upon us. We have not shared the grace you've given us. We have not known the love we should have for one another, as you said would be the declaration of our following you. If we had, you would have turned us from our iniquities. God, help us to understand your truth now in this 2012, in this New Year's Day. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does. Therefore we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. You raised up America by the grace with which you shed upon us. Help us one more time, O God. Shed your grace upon America and upon me. Help us as a land and a people to not suffer the violence with which we feel, to not, God, have that iniquity poured out upon us that you have said we deserve. O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from us, O God. Let it be turned again to the unholy ones. Now, therefore, God, hear the prayer of your servant. Hear my supplication. And for your own sake, O oh God, cause your face to shine upon us once again. Let us know joy in the midst of your people in the sanctuary with which they gather themselves together to worship you. Let them not be so worship of feeling that they forget to hear your voice. Help them to change from the iniquities and sins which so easily beset them, but the cause to set their feet upon a solid rock for the new year. Father, hear my prayer. 
Hear my cry, O God. Minister to the need deep within of each individual soul that has suffered the consequences of their own actions, that has planted the seeds of their own rebellion, that has caused the very violence to take root within their soul and now has caused anger to be in their mindset, that you would change that attitude to one of peace, to one of love, to one of joy. Heal, I pray, O God, I say, that you would do so not with my words, but thy will be done. Forgive, O God, I ask, that you would share your righteousness unto all generations, that you would be merciful according to your loving kindness once again to us all. God, I pray, that you would once again walk in the midst of your land and your people, that you would see us and not weep, that over this new year you would look down from heaven and you would consider well our ways and know that we have begged, pleaded, and caused supplication to come to you, that you would forgive, that you would hear, that you would heal, that you would have mercy, that you would shed your grace upon us, and that you would have your loving kindness to be once again with those who are called by your name, that we would turn from our iniquities and you would pardon our sins. God, I pray, oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see where we are. We who are called by your name, Father, I pray that you would not ignore our supplications and prayers, but that, Lord, you would hear. Lord, you would forgive. Lord, you would listen. God, you would act. Do not delay for your own sake, O Lord my God, for your people who are called by your name, Jesus, I pray. Blessings be upon them and peace this year, that God, you would bring them through the valley of the shadow of death they exist in, and that you would sustain them in the tribulation that comes before the great tribulation, that this new violent power that has gone out into the world, you would heal their soul, and you would give them peace. Jesus, touch the heart of man today, and walk in this land, America, I pray. And use your church throughout the entire world to raise yourself up once again a people called by your name that would love one another and be a light unto the nations that would shine forth as your children who are called by your name that are forgiven, that have extended grace for the grace you've given them. Mercy for how you've been merciful and love for how much you've loved us. Father, I can only pray that in 2012 you hear our prayer, you hear our cry, and you forgive us.